Hello everyone! Last time we took on the Iron Horde in Talador and we tried to stop the Shadow Council from gaining more power. Now it's time to move on and head for the Spies of Arak, a spiky hostile land home to the Arakoa and the Shattered Hand Clan. The story doesn't begin there though, we already got a sneak peek in Talador, so let's begin with that storyline, shall we? An injured Drenai called Kalam informs us that the city of Aruna is burning. Arakoa has swooped down from the spies of Arak, so we're sent in to find his best friend Barum. Luckily, Barum, he was able to escape the city in time, but he has left some precious artifacts behind and he won't be able to make a clear escape with all these Arakoa running around. We're sent in to collect his artifacts, we clear the area, and as we do, we find a female Drenai named Raxi. Raxi is too scared to run away since he fears this will be burned to a crisp by the Arakoa's leader, so we're asked to kill Sun Sage Kyrix. Kyrix yells, artifacts from the greatest age belong to us, you have no claim to them. So apparently the Arakoa they attacked in search of some sort of artifacts and naturally we need to find this artifacts and keep it out of the hands of the Arakoa. You're going after it? Suit yourself, I'm getting out of here! Inside the Aruna crystal mine, we find the artifact, the prism that the Arako were looking for. The strange machine it once powered is completely ruined and it's uncertain what exactly it was used for. Perhaps it was a devastating weapon, perhaps it was some sort of torture device, we simply don't know. So, this is what they were after. Thank you for clearing the way. Out of nowhere, the scared female Drenai shows up and she reveals her secrets. That's quite enough of this illusion, I think. Ah, much better. Destroy that wretched prism. We cannot risk it falling into their hands. Now, just relax. You and I are going to have a chat. Forgive my deception. I had to appeal to your sympathy in order to play you against Kyrex. I have expected him to vaporize you, but you dispatched him quite handily. An impressive display, though it was your decision to enter the mine that truly piqued my interest. Your desire to reveal the truth behind the attack. Fearlessly delving into the unknowable, seeking answers in the dark. I am Iskar. And now that you have become acquainted with the Arakoa, I wonder if you might aid me in subverting them. Shadow Sage Iskar, he explains that not all Arakoa are the same. Some, like himself, have been cursed and they make their homes in the places the world has forgotten. One of these places is called Vila Shadar, but now the uncorrupted Arakoa, they're hunting them, they're trying to purge them from the area. We're in to go and kill the uncorrupted Arakoa while also saving the corrupted Arakoa. And while we do this, we also collect some of the Shadow Tomes. With that mission complete, Iskar and his people, they disappear back into the shadows and the story leads us into the Spires of Arak. We hide no remember. The sun burns the flesh. Only in shadow will you find refuge. This war between corrupted and uncorrupted Arakoa is part of the major storyline in the Spires. The history of it all is explained in bits and pieces throughout the zone, but to make it easier, to make it easier to understand, I'll start off with explaining the history of Arak and the Arakoa. The ancient skies of Arak were once shared by three gods. Rukmar was strong, youthful and ambitious. She flew higher, ever higher, for she loved to feel the sun's warmth upon her feathers. She would climb until she caught fire, but she did not burn. The flames cascaded off of her in long strokes of brilliant red and gold. The sky was her canvas and her children were the Kaliri. Anzu. He was physically meager, but possessed a great intellect. He preferred the cool of the shade and the peace of the twilight hours, where he could be alone in quiet contemplation. He would converse with the gods of the abyss, and he would find them dull, witless creatures. His down was an inky midnight, and his children were the dread ravens. Sefer was cold-blooded and scornful. When he flew, the wind bit his flesh. He would sun himself on the mountain sides, but he could never taste warmth. His scales were frosted glass, and his children were the wind serpents. 
Sefer coveted the favor of the wind and the warmth of the sun. He persuaded Anzu to help him slay Rukmar and take the sky for themselves. But Anzu was cunning and cared little for the wind serpents. In the dark of night, he sent a raven to warn Rukmar of Sefer's intentions. Anzu watched from the top of a mountain spire as Rukmar and Sefer clashed. Sefer struck exactly as Anzu had warned and Rukmar avoided him with ease. She flew high, put the sun at her back and dove at Sefer. Rukmar's talons found Sefer's head with ease. With a great flap of her wings, she split the very sky upon him like the crack of a whip. Sefer crashed into a spire with such force that it crumbled and fell around him. In a flash, Anzu fell upon Sefer, pinning him underfoot. Looking up at the raven god, Sefer uttered a dying curse. My blood shall blacken the sea until it runs thick as tar. My flesh shall fester and spoil until the very sky sky rots with it. Anzu replied, then we shall leave no blood nor flesh. He feasted on the writhing wind serpent and picked the bones clean. Only a small trickle of blood managed to escape the broken spire and blight the valley below. Soon Anzu felt Sefer's hatred coursing through him. His back twisted, his wings became weak, his mind was wrecked with painful visions. The raven god had contained Sefer's curse by taking it upon himself. Anzu would grapple with the curse for some time before retreating to the shadows. Rukmar, terrified of the curse, would never land in Arak again. She would fly far away to new lands and create a new race of people to command the skies. A people who would combine her power and grace with the guile and first of her knowledge of Anzu. She called them Arakoa in hopes that one day they would return to Arak to bask in the wind and sun as she once had. And that's how the Arakoa were born. So Anzu, he took it upon himself, uh, the curse of Sefer, which took away his ability to fly, and it gave him maddening visions. The small trickle of blood that seeped away from Sefer, it would carry on his curse in an area now known as Sefek Hollow. This is where the first Arakoa were turned into corrupted Arakoa. The story behind this is that once upon a time, the Arakoa, they were ruled by Talon King Terok. And although he was beloved, some said that he was Rukmar's chosen, he also had enemies. There were more creatures in Arak that tried to fight the Arakoa. Amongst them, for example, were the Saberon. Long ago, a blood mane pride lord commanded his hunters to bring him 10,000 Arakoa feathers. Eager for the glory of battle, the young chieftain had hoped to incite a war with the Arakoa. But the Talon King came alone, and what ensued was not a war. It was a slaughter. With a sweep of his wings, he cut down even the strongest of the blood mane like so many blades of grass. The Pride Lord was fierce, but he was no match for Terok. He moved with grace and power matched only by the wind. Satisfied that his message was clear, the Talon King left the blood mane to pick up the pieces of their broken tribe. The Talon King was obviously intelligent and extremely powerful, but the betrayal from within would be his downfall. The Talon King's own sages betrayed him. Terak and his allies were cast into the pools. The cursed blood seared his flesh and tore at his mind. As he withered, Terak had but one concern, his daughter Lithic. Seeing her broken body, Terok despaired. He surrendered to the creeping darkness. But in that darkness, something found him. A strange power filled the Talon King. A presence urged him on. Wretches driven mad by the curse, thrashed him out in the pools in agony. But Terak set them free. A strange orb peeked out from the wastes. Gazing into it, Terak met the being that had saved him. The raven god Anzu gifted Terak and his guards with dark powers. In time, they would be known as Talon Priests. Together they would build Skettis and protect the unwanted children of Rukmar. 
As the years passed, the Talon King's health declined. Grief hung in his heart, while the curse chewed relentlessly at his mind. He began to hate this world, abandoning Skedis, and even sacrificing his own people in search of a cure. Hoping to rejuvenate their fading king, the Talon priest sealed Terok away in the shadows. And that's the history between the corrupted and the uncorrupted Arakoa. Now, in these days, those that are found guilty of crimes or those who are simply born unlucky in, in unlucky families or whatnot, they will be placed in the pools in the blood of Sefer and the curse of Sefer will be placed upon them. This has been going on for generations and now that we come into the storyline, we find out that the adherents, that the uncorrupted Arakoa, they are trying to eradicate the corrupted Arakoa and their war is firing up. We're sent to talk to Rashad, the scroll keeper. You want to know why my people flee Iraq? Look outside. Our own kin fear and revile us for this curse. We're asked to collect some important artifacts and take out Sunset Rafix so that Rashad can make his escape. Rafix, he holds a scroll with names on it, names of corrupted Arakoa that the adherents want to take out. Naturally, Rashad's own name is on the list, as well as Ishal of Shadowglade and Zelek of Vio Akras. We bring the scroll to Rashad, who informs us that followers of the old ways, they're gathering and we are needed. We must make our way to Vio Torok, but there are dangers around every corner. Rashad has the power to hide in the shadows, but the bats of the area, they would surely see him. Besides that, adherent assassins are waiting in the shadows for the chance to strike, and we'll have to check out Sif's hut, since there might be valuable information to be found there. We clear the way for Rashad while tricking the assassins into attacking us, and we buy Rashad the time he needs at Sif's hut. Step aside. Let us see if this fellow had anything worthwhile. Mind the door, will you? My, my. What a curious collection. Uh, see? What have you got there? Come now, let's see it. Fifty layers of shadow, fifty Percival! You put that back this instant! Wow, nasty bird! Ah, here's something. The Saga of Terok. And he's written notes inside. Here, have a look. The notes that we find claim that Sif has found the Eye of Anzu, the same artifact that the Talon King used to communicate with Anzu, so this artifact is extremely valuable. We're sent out to retrieve it out of the hands of Sun Talon Oberyx, and with the artifact, we finally arrive at the Veal to Rock. Rastok, I need a shroud at that dig site. Kura, the shadows gather. <laughs> Rashad, you survived Skedis. <laughs> yes, just barely. Are we late? The adherents grow bolder each day. It's all we can do to keep Vale Terok shrouded from them. Do you have the relics? Yes, yes, and something unexpected too. We have much to discuss. One of our men is captured by the corrupted Arakoa, but since they owe us a favor, they let him go, and we're able to inspect our garrison outpost. Afterwards, we return to Field Rock, and the rest of the major storyline is basically us helping out the Arakoa outcast with the war against the adherents and the Shattered Hand Clan, while we also discover more about their history. Thankfully, I already covered the history at the start of the video, so our first mission is to bring back Anzu from the shadows and stop the followers of Sefer. The Eye of Anzu is used to empower and liberate those able to join us, while we also collect a bit of blood from Sefer to use against our enemies. With those tasks done, it's time to take out Sefer's followers. We take out the nest, we kill the children of Sefer, and we use their wings as a sacrifice to bring back Anzu. The mighty god appears in front of us, and some of you might remember Anzu from the dungeon as a boss. Basically, what happened in our reality is that the followers of Sefer, they used the ritual to bind Anzu to their will, so he wasn't fighting us willingly. In 
in this reality, they want to do a similar thing. They also want to bind Anzu to their will, but naturally, we're gonna put a stop to that. Besides that, Talon King Ickes, and Talon King, during his days, he was obsessed with finding out more about the King Turok. He was trying to find out the truth behind his fall, and as he was looking for more information, they banished him, and they placed a curse upon him. You might remember him as another boss that we used to fight, and this time, he's still delusional, he still thinks that he's Terok Reborn, He's not. He's not the follower of Terok, so he needs to die. We take out Ickes, we take out his followers, and with most of the cult taken care of, it's time to stop Sefe from being reborn. The cultists of Sefek, they've been giving their own lives to bring back the accursed god. And like the ancient days, it's Anzu that stands against him. Together with Anzu we fight, and together we bring Sefe down. But even with this victory, Sefe's curse, it will never truly leave the land. Our next objective is finding out more about the powers used by the adherents against the corrupted Arakoa. As you enter the zone, you see a massive beam of light taking out the entire village, and the adherents would like you to believe that these powers are given to them by the will of Rukmar. In truth, the adherents, they found these powers by accident, and it was actually an ancient Arakoa civilization known as the Apexis that found a way to combine magic with solar power into devastating weapons and constructs. The cult of the Apexis is now extinct and it's uncertain what happened to them, although an item found with archaeology, it suggests that they were making plans to build a flying temple in the sky. But it's uncertain if their plans were successful, if there actually is a flying temple in the sky, that we do not know. Now in Outland, so in our reality, we help the ogres of Ogrela with discovering more about the Apexes and their crystals. But here we find the adherents busy with trying to find more secrets and more power. They even use those that survived the incineration of Villacras to excavate for them. So we need to take care of business. We take out the adherents, we disrupt their research, we save those forced to work for them, and we even turn their own weapon against them. Darkscry Rastok says that we can use the devices and the Apexes cores we found against the adherents but we'll need time and a new ally to get that to work. Before we work on that, we'll first have to focus on taking out the Shattered Hand clan, since Kharkov Bladefist and all his Shattered Hand orcs, they've been claiming more and more territory and they've been murdering the Arakoa. The corrupted Arakoa are already facing a very powerful foe with the adherents, so to deal with the orcs, we'll have to bring back an incredibly powerful source. This source, this power, is telling King Turok himself, who was placed in the Shadow Realm so long ago, and we need to prove ourselves worthy to use his powers. And that brings us to today. With the relics and the talent priests in place, we are ready to call upon the talent king. The Talon King is mighty indeed, but we're able to prove our worth and we're granted access to his powers. The Talon King says that our fates are woven together, his people are ours to protect, and our enemies are his to destroy. Together, we go to Bladefist Hold, where the Shattered Hand Clan are rallied, and we take the fight to the orcs. <laughs> Just here for revenge. What? Who are you? I am the Talon King. I have come from beyond death to stem the Iron Tide. This ends now. <sighs> well, I'm Kargath Blade Fist. And when I kill something, it stays dead! Possible that power has failed you. <laughs> so it's you in there. Katgar isn't here to protect you this time. What? Are you alright? That was a close call. We barely got you out in time. That orc, Karkath. Even at my full strength, he would prove a challenge. My children. It will take more than a fading memory from the past to overcome the challenges you face today. You must strike your own path, lay the past to rest, and raise new Champions, you have one already. Hero, 
I can never again grant you my full power. Kargath severed that bond. But so long as you tread in Iraq, some piece of me will remain with you. I will lend my power as often as I can. Not even the might of the Talon King was able to take out Kark of Bladefist, but we have dealt a severe blow to the Shattered Hand Clan, and they won't be causing trouble anytime soon. This leaves us with one major task left to fulfill, turning the Adherent's weapons against them, and once that is done, we can take the battle to Skyreach. There is however one problem, as the name suggests, Skyreach is up in the sky, and the corrupted Arakoa, they can no longer fly. The Raven God Anzu tells us that a cult of corrupted Arakoa, known as the Raven Speakers, they are worshipping Ka'alu, which is Anzu's consorts. She and her ravens would be able to help the outcast with reaching the spires, so we need to make contact with the Raven Speakers and get Ka'alu to help us. The Raven Speakers, they're a little bit nuts and they have problems of their own. The local Saberon, they're on the attack and they interrupt the Ritual of Calling to bring back the Raven Mother. In order to get the ritual started again, we're sent out to recover their scrolls, we retrieve some Dread Raven Eggs, we kill some of the Saberon, and we even get the help with the ritual to bring back the Raven Mother. I sense one who is not of the flock. Come closer, child. You there, scroll keeper. You are not of the Raven Speakers. Why do you stand before me? <coughs> Great Kahalu, the tales of your majesty are woefully inadequate. <laughs> you flatter me, but darkness weighs upon your thoughts. Speak, child. The adherents of Rukmar wield a great power. They would use it to burn us all, including your ravens. They also subjugate my children, forcing them to fight and die. What might you have us do? Great Mother, in the name of Anzu, we ask humbly that you lend us your wings. With your help, we can extinguish the light which sets the sky ablaze. Anzu always was meddling in the affairs of mortals. One would think I might learn from his mistakes. Very well, Scroll Keeper. My flock is yours. Ka'alu has pledged the ravens to the cause, and now we have the wings required to bring the battle to the adherents. Rastok's invention, it will grant us control over the Apex's weapons, but in order to use it, we'll have to get in close. We fly all the way up to the Windswept Terrace, where we take out Windkeeper Kodiax and secure the area around the first weapon. With that done, Ka'alu herself takes to the sky, and she flies to the Terrace of the Dawn to secure the second area. My cries will rattle your enemies like thunder. Thunder. Guide my aim and strike them down! Ka'alu's cry clears the way and the Raven Speaker Acolytes are able to secure the alignment controls. It looks like everyone is in position. Ka'alu, give the signal and get us out of here! With that, the weapons are destroyed. Time to gather our allies and take the battle to Skyreach. Oh, Skyreach. I have not been this close to her in many years. The High Sage will be well protected. We can fly no closer. Destroy their fault, son, that we may meet again in the shade. Naturally, Rashad leaves all the work to us, and we take out the bosses. We take out Ranjit, Araknaf, Rukran, and finally High Sage Virix. When we turn in the final quest, Rashad says the following: Perhaps there is now hope for a brighter future. I can only hope some of those in Skyreach have been awakened, and to this, I wonder what exactly they were hoping to accomplish. It seems to me like we simply kick the crap out of the adherents and we prevent them from using their super weapon. But apparently, Rashad he hopes for more. Perhaps he's talking about the Order of the Awakened that we later find in Ashran. This order contains both corrupted and uncorrupted Arakoa and they wish to reverse the damage done by the adherents of Rukmar. 
They hoped to bring about a peaceful new era for the society, but in order to do this, they required the knowledge of the Apexes, and they gladly exchanged gear for the Apexes crystals that we collect. I wonder, first of all, if they're really trying to get a peaceful era going with this Apexes knowledge, and second of all, I wonder if we'll see more Arakoa later on in the expansion. Perhaps they'll use this knowledge gained from the Apexes crystals to find this so-called floating city in the sky, and perhaps we'll see the Apexes civilization. Who knows what the expansion might bring? For the moment, that's the major storyline of the Spires of Arak. We've secured the area for the Arakoa outcast, we've gained a powerful new ally, and don't get me wrong, there are a couple of other storylines to be found in Arak. You've got Taylor's Garrison, for example, but either these storylines are not really part of the major storyline, or in Taylor's case, I've covered that story in a different video. I'll make sure to link the video in the description if you want to check it out, and as always, thank you very much for watching, everyone. Next time, we'll take the story into Nagrand, home of the Warsong clan, we'll find out more about the Shadow Council, still plenty of story left to tell. Subscribe if you like my videos and until next time guys, see ya! Our bond is iron. Our will unbreakable. Who will stand against us?